So, All Scott, right. are you in the garage by your car? Mm, by the Pikes Peak car. Okay. Yes. All right. Well, this thing is recording, so let's uh, let's dive into this. If everybody's ready. So, this is going to be episode number twenty-three of the Flatiron Syndicate Motorsports Podcast. For this episode, we've got a special guest with us. We've got Mike Pettiford from Go For Racing. Oh. Scott is showing Viet. Viet's trying to hide out this time. And today we wanted to have a conversation about something that's going on in the world right now that maybe is not getting an, as much attention as we think maybe it should, which is uh, something that's called the RPM Act, which is an act that's actually in the process of being going through Congress, but it's kind of stalled out. And so the purpose of this is just kind of have a discussion about it and why we think it's important because we, I think all of us here agree that it's, it's a pretty important thing. And I'm going to say right up front that if you, if you are listening to this or you're watching this and you uh, agree with us at some point in, in this conversation that this is important, you know, maybe you know, I'll, I'll put a link to uh, uh, SEMA has got a, a page about the RPM Act where you can kind of click to support it and reach out to your, your respective congressperson to let them know that you're in favor of the RPM Act going through. So what I might suggest is if you're, if you're convinced by anything that we say, you know, maybe post something about that, that, that link that SEMA's put up or, or something of, of what they're doing, just to kind of try and increase the awareness for what the RPM Act is and why it's important. Um, well, and if you're not convinced about anything that we say today, you should go educate yourself you should definitely research. go click on this link and do some research and educate yes. yourself because what we're about to talk about is our livelihood. Anybody mm -hmm. who, well, basically anybody who's into performance cars, it's our livelihood, but anybody who races cars, it's, it's their livelihood too. It, yeah. So to an extent, possibly. Um, if you, if you don't think it's important, they will be coming for you next. Yes. Yes. So let's, one one of the things that I've seen of late is that because the RPM Act, it's actually been bouncing on Congress for a few years now. It's it's kind of stalled out. It's gotten moved from kind of one um, committee to another. So like there's there's kind of a general consensus that it's not that important or or you know it's it's just stalled out in Congress and it's not a big deal. So just a little preface of, of a lead in what this what this is all about. Um, short and sweet, what the RPM Act does is it, if Congress would pass it, is that it would be a federal precedent that it is, allows you to take a car that has a VIN number that was, per, that was a factory produced vehicle and turn it into a race car. Basically adapt it to, for race use only. Um, this, this is basically something that was not covered in something called the Clean Air Act. So the Clean Air Act was written back in the 70s, I think it was 72 or 74, when there was a lot of issues with pollution. And the Clean Air Act has done a lot of really good things to help, you know, help the environment, help our, help our air and reduce pollution. But when they wrote this thing, there was some, some parts of it that were written with, well, let's just say fairly simple language. And so one of the things that's in the Clean Air Act is it says that it, it, you're not allowed to ever remove an emissions device from a, from a mass-produced vehicle. So it's something that has a VIN number. And it was just, there's just basically just some simple language there. And I would argue that probably there was just not a, a thought or an awareness of how many, like how many amateur uh, motorsports people are using a production car as a race car. They were, they were just kind of trying to you know, make a simple statement of just, hey, we got to keep emissions devices on cars. But the way that it was simply put, there's some ramifications that are now kind of coming into significance. So, so the RPM Act is basically to try and correct that, that language, to kind of expand upon you know what what you're able to do with a, a vehicle that is that was like mass produced for public or for 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 transportation believe it or not there is no legal precedent up until this point that that says you can or can't do this but why this is really important now is there is about to be 
So right now in Arizona, there's a case with a, a, a company called Gearbox Z or GBZ and the EPA. And SEMA has stepped in to help Gearbox Z with their case. But basically the, the fundamental core of the case is whether or not it is legal to take a production vehicle and turn it into a race car. So because there's no precedent at this point, however that case goes, that is going to be the first legal precedent. Now that's, that's on a regional level, that's in Arizona, but obviously that's, that is now gonna be the precedent if that case should come up in any other states. So why the RPM Act is important is if we can reach out to our Congress people and let them know that, hey, we, we really wanna still have the ability to do this, to, to take a production car and turn it into a race car, if they can pass that through Congress, then that's a federal standard that would apply to all 50 states that allows us to do this. So that's, that's why it's important now because there's this court case that's going through Arizona that's, that's really gonna have potentially a lot of, of far reaching consequences because that's now, however it goes, uh, that's now gonna be the precedent. So that's, that's why we wanna have a conversation about this because if we can, if we can get the word out about what's going on and why the RPM Act is important uh, and, and hopefully get that to go through Congress like at some point in the not too distant future, then that will take a little bit of the, the weight off of the Gearbox Z case and set kind of a, a more, basically a national standard. And, and so that'll help kind of really kind of clarify what is and isn't allowed. So that's, it's kind of the, the preface for why we wanted to have this conversation, just to raise awareness about why this is important in like today as, as, we're, as we're having this conversation. Well, and, and if everyone was rich enough to have a purpose-built race car built from the ground up that didn't have a VIN number on it, we could all go out and, and race no problem because right. it, it has nothing to do with that. The, the main issue is, is that none of us can afford to do that. We have to go out and buy essentially ship boxes or in some people's cases, you know, brand new Corvettes and yep. then turn them into, turn them into race cars. But it's, it, it, it's that simple thing. You know, if you take spec Miata or uh, um, say like a spec BMW E30 class, you know, these are cars where, the, it, they're one of the cheapest forms of racing out there. You can go out and you buy, you know, late 80s, early 90s shit box, if you will. And then you can convert this thing into one of the cheapest forms of motorsports out there. And if this doesn't pass, you're not really going to be able to do that um, to the point of actually adding power or removing restrictions um, from the motor, you know, like catalytic converters, you know, in order to go out and do that. So if it doesn't pass, like the new standard will be, you go out you and you buy a ship box and you can put a roll cage in it, maybe put some suspension and brakes on it and you can't touch the power. So Ryan, what is a spec or like a, an E30, early E30 BMW? How much horsepower does that have? I think like 125 or something like that. Okay. Like, and that's, that's with whatever emissions components are on it. And I mean, those parts are probably getting harder and harder to find. And I don't know, it'd be a whole new industry that have to be created just to keep up with it. Right. <clears throat> well, the other, one other thing that needs to be said is open wheeled cars are going to be exempt from this anyway. Like if you're going to yeah. go out and buy a, a formula V, which is pretty inexpensive, uh, but it's a you know it's a race car from day one, yep. uh, or Formula Fords, or Formula Mazdas, or Pro Formula Mazdas, or Formula Atlantics, or all of those cars are not going to be affected by this because they were never street legal and they never had a VIN number. Right, and but it's, the thing of it is, is how many like how many people are running those cars currently versus something that was originally like sold and driven on right. the street. And it's, it's, it's a small fraction. Yep. Much less. And so that the, the ultimate concern that we have is that this could have a real impact on kind of amateur motorsports, just amateur motorsports in general. 
um, and, and the well, ability to, to feed people into it. To say nothing of the enthusiasts. I mean, right. there's, there's plenty of people that don't really ever want to race, but they want their car to go a little bit faster, get a little bit better economy, et cetera, et cetera. Sure. And this is going to affect them in a big way as well. I will say for this conversation, I think the best thing for us to do is to focus on the RPM Act because that's the thing that is tangible that we can actually reach out to our Congress people and, and let them know what, what the enthusiasts think about how important the RPM Act is. That's the thing that is on our plate right well, now. But, yeah. but to Mike's point, um, a, a lot of this stuff that we are talking about has to do with also the enthusiasts that Mike's talking about. True. And I know we're not talking about the RPM Act here, but if this act doesn't pass and they do continue to make it, or if they, if they do make it illegal to modify these things on race cars, there's no chance in hell that you're going to be able to do this on a street car. True. And well, yeah. The, the street it, car argument is a much harder one to make. For, because it gets that you 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 dive into a, a huge gray area that that's that's going to be that's going to be difficult you know for for race use only i think there's there's a lot of there's a lot of strong arguments that can definitely be made for for race use for race cars and so that's where i think that's this gives us the strongest place to start as far as letting basically kind of bringing things up to current you know, getting getting some kind of understanding for what an what what an enthusiast or an amateur uh, racing driver or racing team is doing, because that's I mean it 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 affects everything. It affects every aspect from you know somebody that wants to tinker with their car at home to somebody that, I mean heck, I mean a lot of the some of the racing you would even see on TV that is using a production based chassis. It affects all of that. Well, and, and one thing that maybe needs to be clarified or defined is what is a race car? Right. Okay? A lot of people call the car that they used for competition, if it's like a solo event or a Gymkhana or time attack, and there's no roll cage in it and there's no log book, but they will swear and they're right. It's their race car right now it's really their competition car right because it's not wheel to wheel racing but it'll be interesting to see that dynamic and how it plays out in this particular scenario yeah and and I'll, I'll play a little devil's advocate here which is to say you know what we're what we're talking about is power modifying power levels and and, and it's not to say that you can't use a, a car to compete. You, it's not to say that you can't take a car off, off the showroom floor and then go and drive it at a track or at an autocross. You, you still can do that. It's just that you, what they're saying is that you can't modify the, the amount of power that the vehicle makes. So I think that that might be one of the, one of the, one of the arguments that they would make as far as why, the, why they feel like this is okay because it's, it's letting us do that activity, but basically not not have any exemptions to to you know emit more pollutants than anybody else that's using a vehicle to do whatever they might be doing well and so one of the other things is that they're trying to do with that original clean air act well what they did with that original clean air act with their wording is it is against the law to manufacture or sell any of these devices that you would use to turn your race car into a race car or your street car into a race car. Right. Um, so some of the ramifications there are basically the, the industry, all these companies that are making these parts. Um, if it's all of a sudden completely illegal to make them and or sell them, imagine the amount of companies that are just going to go under because yeah. there, you know, there's if, a, if you, yeah, yeah. There's a big infrastructure. There, there's a big, huge. There's there's a big industry around doing this, and and I'm not, I don't want to say that that industry is not going to be affected by this. I think I think that 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 our industry is going to be affected by this, to to some degree, as a given. There there's no, there's no way to keep our industry from having to change its course. 
but without any gray area to allow any production of these parts, like you said, Scotty, I mean, it, it's a very, it becomes a very black and white issue. And fundamentally in the Clean Air Act, it, it, was, it was framed with very simple language that made it very black and white and did not leave any kind of openings or exceptions. And that's, that's kind of the struggle. They, there, there's an impact on a huge amateur motorsports group that I, I would say may, may not have been intended in, in the writing of it, but it's, it's now going to have that impact potentially. So that's, that's what we're up against. I'm kind of surprised that all of the people in the aftermarket industry, some of them who have a lot of money, haven't hired a bunch of really big, nasty lawyers to attack this because, I mean, it's going to put so many people out of business. I mean, I mean, thousands of companies I can't imagine that they wouldn't band together and get this clarified so that it, it's not an issue anymore. Well, and, and to be fair, SEMA is doing a lot to try and move in that direction, to try and, to try and get some, some, some clarification and some wiggle room. But it's, it's one of those things where it's because the language was fairly simple, and it, I think, too, I mean, you'd say, this is, this is back in the 70s. This is really before, I mean, we even had computers that were running cars. Right. Yeah. Things have changed so much in the last 40 years. I think in some ways, just, just the, the change of, of what a car is now compared to what it was before and what the possibilities are now compared to what they were before, that's where more clarification is, is helpful. To a certain extent, I think how the industry has gotten to the point where it is, like you, because this is a, an industry, is because there's just not, not been a lot of clarification because a lot of the enforcement is based on a document that is decades old and that did not have, it, it, they didn't expand about any, in, in many details that would be helpful to have clarification on. So in, in some ways, what, what SEMA is trying to do and what, what we really need to do is to get a lot better clarification and understanding on, on how this works or, or, and what is possible. But that's, that's, what we're, that's what we're trying to move towards. Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> I think it's a, it's a touchy thing too. I mean, Mike talking about uh, companies lawyering up and stuff to try and protect themselves in the industry. I mean, a lot of people are also concerned about attracting attention of the EPA to them because you're talking about going against the United States government who has, as soon as, as soon as they believe that you've committed any kind of crime, I mean, they're going to have access to your phone records, your business records, your, I mean, every contact that you've had. You know, some of these companies right. have faced multi-million dollar lawsuits and they've just put them into oblivion. And can't it's hard for them to go against hard for people to take that chance <clears throat> well the other the other thing that i'm thinking of is you know let's say uh, i'll play a little devil's advocate as well let's say that this goes through and now it's illegal and okay there's a big race at a track with let's say 500 racers yeah like and sec police, runoffs or something yeah and the, and the police show up and they say okay it's illegal that will be on the news, my friend. <laughs> I think that will get some attention. Yeah. And, and I mean, and that's, that's racers potentially... will not go quietly. <laughs> well, I mean, they, they openly admitted that uh, the EPA openly admitted that they're not going after the racers. They're going after the manufacturers. So, I mean, it's like right. stopping the water hose at the spigot and not at the end where the water comes out, you know? Right. And when you stop the, those performance parts from being created, it does create all these other things that happen. There's a snowball effect, right? Like you've got, of course, big race teams like BMW will still find a way to manufacture their own components or, you know, stuff like that. But the amateur motorsports person, you're going to get way more creative. And let's face it, we're not engineers. And anything that I'm going to do to try and make my car to make more power is going to be probably way sketchier than what Cobb tuning is doing already, you know? Right. Right. And it might have a lot more ramifications compared to actually if they can 
clarify a process mm -hmm. that that you could go down. Um, mm -hmm. You know, for instance, I, I think there there's an opportunity here for racing organizations to work with in hands in conjunction with EPA. Um, you know, it, at at a very simplistic level, there. The other part of this that's a little confusing, and this this might well be one of the things that's confusing to people. If you have to pass emissions, there is a standard for what your car is allowed to emit, and there is a way that they test for that currently. And so, what is what is it, it makes sense, but it's a little confusing. Is that even if your car passes that test, but it's been modified, it's still not okay to modify that car. Mm -hmm. What if what if we expanded what what that test was what if like say in a in a spec class or any kind of a racing class you had to be able to show that the vehicle now meets this established standard for emissions to be to be compliant in the class so in other words if you can modify the car but show that you are still like basically below the legal limit for particulate emissions that that, that would be okay to run I would, well, I would much, I would not want to go down that rabbit hole, but uh, <laughs> I, I can see Corvettes making a lot less power. Um, but what I would like to bring into, into yeah. thought here, and I think, John, you and I talked about it, is most race cars don't travel a lot of miles. You know, I mean, you take a, a somebody that's driving 15,000 miles a day with their, or a year with yeah. their regular car compared to, we put maybe, I mean, under a thousand miles in a season on a race car, typically. Yep. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So an, another aspect of this that has had a lot of effect or a lot of impact is on modifying diesel trucks, uh, diesel pickup trucks. So, and, and, and arguably there's, there's many more diesel trucks on the road that people are using that people wanted to, to modify for whatever application than sport compact cars. Um, and one of the arguments is that, well, a modified diesel truck emits 300 times the emissions of a non-modified truck. And so that's why we need to step in and make sure that these trucks are not being uh, modified because if you, modify a handful of these diesel trucks, it's gonna have a really significant impact on the amount of emissions because of how many of them there are and how much worse it is. So the, the mm -hmm. argument that I would make to Mike's point is, well, if, with a race car, if you're driving it one three hundredth, say, of the amount of miles of a production or of a street driven car, like a car that's just used for transportation, can there be some kind of a of a standard there, or, or it, does that give us some kind of grounds to have a conversation? Or and, an exemption. And, or an exemption. It, so, and, and one of the other things that is illegal is removing a functioning catalytic converter from your car. And so... Or, or any emissions device, to be fair. Or any emissions device. Now, there are companies out there like Jesse, G-E-S-I. So they make high flow performance catalytic converters right. that could be put into say a, a race vehicle that would help reduce the amount of, of emissions. Yep. But if this, if this doesn't pass, it, it is going to be legal to remove your restrictive catalytic converter to put in a high flow catalytic converter, even though that high flow catalytic converter is, going to reduce the amount of uh, uh, emissions particulates released into the atmosphere, but you can't even do that right. so that's, with, with this act. That, that's even, kind of the direction even, that I was starting to go down. Yeah, go ahead. Right. Even, I was just going to say, even if the car passed emission standards with the new catalytic converter on there, it would still be illegal. Yeah. Which right. is ridiculous. Right. So be, because of yeah. the simplistic language, th there's, it's, very, it's very simple there's there's not any detail and it's a very black and white thing and that's what's creating a lot of the confusion and the conundrum and so that's kind of to your point Scott, that's what the direction i was trying to start to go down with setting an emission standard for a race car mm -hmm. you, it could be you could modify a car and make a good deal more power and still be emissions compliant 
if they would open that door, if they would be willing to have that conversation. Possibly. One of the one of the parts one of the parts of the languages they'd have to adjust though is that right now you can't even make a change to an emissions component like say through a tune or something yep. that would accelerate the wear of a factory emissions component. Right. So say you'd have to be able to prove that hey this tune that's on my Corvette or on my Subaru even though it passes emissions today um, that it's not wearing the components faster. I mean that was. I mean, I think that's going to be a huge hurdle to try and get past and something that an amateur motorsport person and a tuner is not going to be able to really prove with any substantial, you know, evidence. Well, wouldn't, the, yeah. wouldn't that be relative to the driving? I mean, you can, you could get a tune on your Subaru or on your Corvette. And if you're still doing 55 on the highway, you're not going to wear it out any quicker. There you go. Probably not. Probably not. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I rest my case. Well, and, and to be fair, one of the one of the issues that's kind of underlying this is there there have up uh, there's a a past precedent where a lot of catalytic converters did not have to be tested and vetted. So there like there's something that's called a federally legal catalytic converter that's available in certain states, no no longer available in Colorado. But one of the issues with these catalytic converters is that the manufacturer just had to say, this works the way that, that, way that you've stipulated it has to, as far as what the particulates uh, reduction is and how long it will work, how long it will continue to reduce those particulates. But it never had to be independently tested and vetted. And so there, there's, that, that's, I think, in part, some of the issue that, that is far more reaching than the, the motorsports enthusiast group. So this is this is something where, you know, you you have a car that has a, a catalytic converter failure, a legitimate failure. It just it just stopped working. It broke. You're not passing emissions. You know, if you would go to an emissions place, you would this previously would have been an option to have a just a federally legal cap put in the car to help you pass emissions, and not have to buy a, an OEM catalytic converter set. But that's what the issue is is that they've discovered that those don't last as long because there's not as much testing and vetting. So I think if we're, if, I mean, that we're not going to probably be able to continue doing what we've been doing as easily and as simply as it's been done in the past, because if we're going to continue to, to do what we want to do or, or move in the direction with performance and making power that we want to, we, the responsibility would be on us if they're willing to have a conversation uh, to make sure that we're doing it in a responsible way. Well, and, and John, to your, to your point, a lot of times enthusiasts will get a better and less expensive part to both increase the performance and still, you know, be totally compliant with the emissions. And if you bought the original stock part, it would cost over double what you just got. So it becomes yeah. not even a good decision to do that. Yeah, it's it is. There's for for an for a non motorsports from a non motorsports standpoint. There's a whole different aspect to it, which is it makes it potentially more difficult or expensive to repair an older vehicle. Right. If, if if I mean the 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 point where you can have a failure in an emission system where it's going to cost more than the value of the car to repair it, <laughs> it all of a sudden it, it that that threshold has gone way down uh, you know in certain circumstances but that's I mean, that's there's so much gray area for the street that's where i i kind of want to get us back to the talking about the race cars because that's where it's it's it is a lot easier to make the argument for race car Kind of like back to your point, Mike, with how few miles the car is driven, you know, relative to any other production car and, and what's, what is done with the car and like why it's the, the, the impact on the enthusiast group, if, if this were to go through, that it, that it would have. Um, well, the other, the other thing is, you know, with, with private property, let's say you're a farmer. Yeah and you've got an old tractor that doesn't have any emission stuff on it at all, on private property, I'm not aware that you can enforce that. Now, I'm not a lawyer and I don't play one on TV, so I could be totally wrong, but 
you know, if there's a race and everybody's got a race car with a log book and a roll cage and it's on private property, I don't think they can do anything. But I, and I see that that's not the point. If they don't make yeah. the parts, then none of that matters. So, yeah. I'm right. 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 It, it's, it's, it's basically, it's, it's making the parts is, is the core of the issue. And that's, right. that's where the RPM Act, if it would pass, that, that opens the discussion and, and kind of opens the gray area to at least be able to produce tested and vetted parts that, that, that offer performance gains, but in a responsible way. And now, now only going on to cars that are never to be used on public roads or registered, yes. But, but that's what opens the conversation and, and keeps that possibility viable. And, and why, where I, I think that the, the part of this conversation that I want to say and why that's important is because of the variety of competition that that at least would still keep open. It's like, Mike, it, it's, it's great to have you on this conversation because what you're going through with your solstice is very relevant here. So, so Mike has a couple of Solstice turbo cars that he races, and it's what, what class is it in currently? Uh, you can run them in T2 or T3, the turbo ones. Okay, so, so in the SECA or, T2. Or, or STU, all, okay. of, all of those classes. Unlimited. But one of the issues that you're having in T2 is that with, without not relevant to any of this per se, the car is has some restrictions that are put on it as far as what you can, what you can do to modify it because they don't want to kind of give you an, uh, an, an open or blank page to, to modify the power. So because of those restrictions on the modification you could do, the car is not competitive in the class. Right. Is that fair? So, so you're trying to kind of either get, get the, the, the regulations for what you can do to modify the car changed so that it could be more competitive in the class or to change the classing of the car with the modification so that it could be competitive in that class. Correct, because right now it's not competitive in T2 or <clears throat> T3 strictly because of the rules that SCCA puts on the car. And, and, and if I'm understanding like relevant to this conversation, some of those rules are how much boost pressure you can make and what turbo is on the car. Uh, correct, turbo, okay. uh, there's no restriction on boost pressure okay but the turbo has to be stock. And, and you have to run it through a restrictor, I believe. Is that right? Uh, in T3, yes. In STU, yes. In T2, no. Okay. Okay. But the, so the turbo is, is fixed. So th that's kind of a perfect example. If you could put a different turbo on the car that might be 20, 30% more efficient and tune for it at a certain given boost level, then the car could be run reliably, make a, a little bit more power and that might be enough of a nudge to get it to be competitive. Absolutely. But if you take, if you take any of those options off the table, then your tools to make that car competitive in that class <clears throat> basically go away entirely. Right. And, and you know, you, you've modified the suspension. It has a cage in it. There's, there's probably been weight reduction that is able to be done within the rule set. So, so that, that platform then would cease to be competitive. Right. And, and ultimately, like that's kind of the, the, the thing that I would, I would say, if, if we are not allowed to make race or to, to modify race cars, even in a responsible way, that they're, they're basically there's no, there's no ability to modify a car for competition. So like, ex, like long-term what the possibility would be is like saying TT or T2, if it's, like what, what car won uh, the runoffs last year, Mike? Um, in T2, I'm pretty sure it was a Porsche 911. Okay. So, so if the 911 won with, with you know, whatever modification rules are set, then all of a sudden, like, until a manufacturer would make something that would fit into that class and be able to beat the 911, that would kind of become a 911 class. There's no – it would take away the ability to, like, take a slightly different platform or a different car – and try and bring it up to that same level. You, you're, there's no ability to, to do that. Because, well, because in, the, totally in, the, in, the, in the T1 class with the Corvettes, it's, it's going to be exactly the same. Um, you know, we can have headers. We can take off the catalytic converter. 
we can reflash the ECM. And, you know, you have seven liter Corvettes and 6.2 liter Corvettes, both in the T1 class, mm -hmm. but with different restrictor plates and at different weights to equalize the cars. Yeah. But, but if, you, if you take away the ability to modify the power production of any of those platforms, whichever one is the best from the factory, I mean, that's, that's kind of going to be it. Sure. And, and I, like I was thinking about, like, even, Scotty, the, the class that you run where it's power to weight, you know, power to weight makes a lot of sense in, in terms of classing because that's a way, in theory, to kind of level the playing field between a lot of different platforms. And, and yes, there's, there's other parts of the rule set. But in theory, you know, if you have a 3,000-pound car and you can make a maximum of 300 horsepower, and, and every car that's in that class has basically that same set of rules. Now the, the options as far as platforms that you can bring into that class and still be competitive is more open. But if you cannot modify the power level of, of any of those platforms, then there's gonna be one that's gonna be the best. And it's gonna be very difficult to get another platform that would, that would be competitive with whatever that best like from from the from the showroom floor platform would be well, well and, and go ahead, go, go ahead Mike. <laughs> so ryan how much horsepower does the uh, that uh chris mayfield's bmw we we i know we've talked about this before but his mayfield's bmw like at a stock it's a it's a, it's a, it's a what e80 i don't know the names yeah, so it's a E92 or an E90 because it's a two door. Yeah, and their factory crank horsepower is 414. And I believe with like the base supercharger kit that he has, which he could be making more, the base power level at the crank's 560. So I mean, that's so, but, 140 but, but horsepower. Stock, it's 414 stock, it's at the crank. Something. Yeah. yeah, and that's and that's essentially a TT3 car right out of the box where right yeah a stock subaru is also a, well stock sti is also a tt3 car um but so subaru claims 300 horsepower uh bmw claims what four would you say 400 414 um yeah. but yeah so those two cars apples to apples it they won't be competitive so like right. a, a perfectly stock car in a TT3 10 to 1 power to weight class, there's, there's no competition there. So unless I can add extra power, I wouldn't be able to compete with that car at all. And, and, or, or you could reduce weight to be fair, but there's a point where that weight reduction becomes like impossible. Safety like, concern. Sa a safety <laughs> concern, yes. <laughs> the, the, the physics well, but, becomes an issue, yeah. But <laughs> then he can redu reduce weight also. You know, if we're, yeah. if we're stuck with the same things, we, you can do weight reduction, suspension, brakes, tires. The, those two cars, you do all of that, he's still going to have more power. He's still going to get down a straight faster than I am. So, And, and the concern so, that I would have is it, is that I, I would see the potential if, if we're not allowed to, if we're not allowed any kind of a gray area or wiggle room to modify a race mm -hmm. car, that almost every class would be kind of a spec class because there's going to be, there's going to be a platform from the showroom floor that is going to be the ideal one for the, for a certain class. And, and unless you have ma auto manufacturers that start battling it out and really trying to produce a platform that's competitive for a class, I mean, it's, you're just kind of going to be left with, we'll get the thing that is competitive, and, and that's really your only choice. Well, and, also and the, other, the, the other thing is, and, and everybody on the screen here knows that part of the challenge of racing, regardless of the type, is to try to get your car or the car that you can afford or the car that you like to compensate you know, like, let's say your car doesn't have a lot of power, like the Solstice, yeah. normally aspirated Solstice in T4 is the slowest car uh, as far as acceleration, yeah. but it's the best handling and the best braking. So you've got to do it the old fashioned way and be able to drive your butt off 
to get in front of other cars before the twisty bits yeah. so that you can amass enough of a lead that on the straightaway, which they're going to close you up, if, if you can't do that, then you're never going to win a race in a T4 solstice. And everybody on this screen has modified their car by weight or suspension or tires or, or, or you know, or turning their driving up to 11. Yeah. You know, to compensate. For sure. And, 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 and to be fair, I mean, and I guess a little devil's advocate is all of those opportunities to modify the car, like weight, weight reduction, suspension, braking, wheels and tires and handling, all of those are not affected by this. Right. So, so you could, you could certainly just throw all, throw all of your energy into that. And there's, there's nothing wrong with that. And honestly, working to improve as a driver, there's nothing wrong with that. And that's always a good thing. I'm sure everybody here mm -hmm. would agree, but there's, yeah, there's but, just a point but where it's so much funner to actually throw a bunch of power at it. Sure. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, the oh, other oh, side of it too, which I think is totally fair is how cars make power, like how a stock STI makes power, like where its power band is, you know, for emissions compliance for, I mean, just like maybe what Subaru thought that the car would be in a performance aspect versus how a BMW makes power and how they behave on the street and stuff. I mean, not even being able to change that, even if the number is going to be the same, say like on Scotty's STI, but he's able to ship that power band into like a more competitive and more reasonable, you know, like place. I mean, the, to lose the ability to do that can really stive and kill off cars too. Because like when you think, like anybody listening, like, well, if a 400 horsepower BMW is in the same class as a, two, a 300 horsepower Subaru, they should still be competitive because this one weighs 4,000, this one weighs 3,000. But like what's really happening is, is the BMW car, the way it makes power, makes power a lot differently than the way that a Subaru makes power. Yeah. And not even being able to adjust that really can put a, a damper on it. even the change, even like beyond just the number that it makes, where it makes those numbers. Mm. I mean, changes the total behavior of the car. <clears throat> yeah. And, well, and, 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 and back to the point, yes, it's a lot of fun to have the most amount of power and humiliate <clears throat> people on the straightaways. And I resemble that remark, but it's just as much fun to pass those guys <laughs> with an under horsepowered car yeah. and out break them yep. and out corner them. So it just depends on the day now, doesn't it? It, well, does. it depends on the track now also, right? Yeah. 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 You're going to get motored at road America. <laughs> yep. Well, and, and, and to your point though, Mike, I mean, there's, there's another part of, I, I would say, especially amateur racing where part of the fun of it is taking a car that is not competitive in a class and finding a way with, with all of the tools that you have available to you to bring that car up and make it competitive. And, and Scotty, your car is a perfect example of that. Cause just like I said, your, your car showroom, showroom floor to showroom floor is not competitive with that BMW, but what you've done in modifying it now, and to be fair, the majority of your modifications are, handling, aero, brakes, and, and weight reduction, mm -hmm. but, but still a little bit of power is, is to get it up to the point where all of a sudden it is competitive. And, and there's, there's, I think that ability to kind of reinvent the wheel or reinvent the chassis is, is a part of the appeal of amateur motorsports. And the concern is if you take away a big chunk of that, like, how how much of an effect would that have on amateur motorsports in general? And I, I've, I've, my concern is that it would be a lot. Yeah. I, I mean, there's, there's this whole other side. I mean, one of the big things that we all have to remember is that the RP, RPM Act isn't going to be a cure-all or a fix-all. There's so many no. other implications of this EPA stuff. Manufacturers, I mean, you already see it right now, one of our competitors – what isn't even selling any catalyst downpipes, you know, like because they've been hit with a multi million dollar lawsuit. Um, you're seeing that just from a manufacturing and a sales standpoint, even if race cars could be legal, if the amount of people who are buying those components shrinks to a small percentage, which is really what the RPM Act is, is fighting for, the cost is going to of these components are going to go, they are going to skyrocket 
or they're not going to be available. And, and that's that's the price that we have to acknowledge that we're going to have to pay mm -hmm. is that you, there. a lot of times I would say pretty much any kind of catalyt a complete catalytic converter removal pipe at this point is large, pretty much unavailable on, on the market yeah. presently for, for many reasons. But I would say that the majority of people that were picking those, just generally speaking, was based on a price point versus any other criteria. And, and as an enthusiast group, I think that's what we have to realize is like, you're right, Ryan, the RPM Act does not fix a lot of it, but it's the start. And if we're gonna continue to be able to modify our cars, what we have to realize is we're gonna have to do it in a very environmentally responsible way, which will largely mean that the cost will be up. But, but it's, it's like, we want to have the ability still. If, if we want to have the ability still and have the options to move in this direction, even if it's just for a race car, mm -hmm. we have to acknowledge that it's got to be done in as responsible a way as possible. And, and that's, that is the price that we pay. Well, now at, at that aspect, uh, and, and so American Rally Association rally cars, these yep. cars have to be street legal so they can transit in between stages. Yep. Now, they, these cars are required to have a catalytic converter on them. And a lot of these people will actually just put, weld a catalytic converter at the very end of the pipe. Yep. It, it has one to, to, to help with these emissions. But if this, if this doesn't pass, those rally cars, I mean, it's basically going to be an, another stock car. So, I mean, you would take a, a stock Subaru, you would modify suspension and brakes, put a roll cage in it, and that's what rallying would have to be at this point. Mm -hmm. um, it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you, the, the ability, like, so as far as rally cars that are available out there, there's a Subaru Impreza. What else is turbocharged all-wheel drive these days? that you could actually go rally with right out of the box. Golf R. What, yeah. a, a Golf well, R. Yeah. Focus, Maybe. Focus RS. Yeah. They don't make and those you, anymore. <laughs> okay. You can still find them. You, 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 you can still find them. But, but so, I mean, yeah, the, the, the amount of cars, I mean, it, it's very possible that ARA could turn into just a, a, a Subaru, Subaru class. Only. <laughs> yeah. Well, or, or just – you not not be able to run a production car period um it, it, yeah, yeah. I, I wanted to get to rally and thank you for bringing that up scotty because i mean that's that's one of our roots and and the unique aspect of rally racing is just as you said it has to be registered and able to drive on public roads because the stages are set apart so you have to drive from the pits to the stage run your stage and then transit to the next stage to run it and those are those transits are on public roads so that's always been part of part of what rally rules are and so if all of a sudden like all of those power mods go in yeah you're you're going to be much more limited and, and to, to an extent back to the other point that i was making earlier whatever the fastest car from the showroom floor is in its configuration once you modify the brakes and suspension like that's it like there's really that that's going to be the car yeah you that's know, the, the the ARA rally is the spec Subaru class. And then you have whatever the fastest front wheel drive class is, uh, whatever the fastest naturally aspirated, uh, whatever you find that's going to be, it, it's going to turn into spec rally racing. And, and I mean, be, that's, yeah. that's, that's definitely going to happen on uh, like an amateur budget level. But if you really think about it, these big time companies like STI is a division of Subaru, right? Yeah. So STI could make their own, special Subaru that that's and then you get in homologations and all that stuff where there's no way that any of us would ever be able to compete with that like cars that are street legal that have all the emissions components that haven't been modified but make power and aren't attainable for the I mean that's really like the rich people are going to be able to continue to do motorsports they're going to continue to modify their stuff because you're going to have in-house engineers and have all this stuff that they can do to, to go around and defeat because EPA isn't out there on a rally stage right now, as far as we know, checking to make sure cars have catalytic converters. 
like I said, it stops at the manufacturing. So if the manufacturers of parts where amateurs can afford those parts, right. stop manufacturing yeah. parts, then the only people are going to be winning or racing are going to be the elitists. I mean, that's what it really comes down to. Buying a Corvette, a stock Corvette, isn't going to cut it when you've got, you know, a company who will straight up manufacture their own components to, to, to win. I mean, unless the rules in these segments where like IRA or SCCA and all this stuff where, where they are also 100% in line with the EPA standards, there's going to be the rich people are getting, the rich companies are going to be able to keep doing. They're going to just absolutely swamp out amateur drivers. None of us will actually be able to afford to race. Absolutely. I mean, I, not to win. <laughs> not not to win. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah, go, go ahead, entry Mike. Entry fees aren't going up. Yeah. Well, to to be fair, it's always been like that, buddy. <laughs> well, yeah. You say that, you know, so I mean, that I win. No, to be, to be fair, <laughs> if you're really wealthy and you spend sp uh, smart money and you have a super driver, guess what? You're going to be really, really, really hard to beat, and and that's the way racing's always been. The, yeah, the, but, only but, reason, the only reason that I've won a few races is because I've got good credit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So there's, that, there's, yeah. there's still, I mean, and it's not just rally racing. But I mean, that's your hill climbs. That's your time attack. That's your, that's your, just your time trials programs. And they're not even on national levels. Your NASA and your SCCA, the two largest, you know, racing organizations in the country, membership-wise, um, most of those events are happening – in our backyards, you know, yep. so you don't have, you know, Roush racing team bringing out some crazy, you know, Corvette or Mustang and racing amongst us, but we might see them at the national level, but there's still rich people that live around us and live amongst us that uh, might decide that may, they're going to have an advantage, a stronger advantage over us. Well, who, when an access port goes from 600 to 5,000, and yeah. you have to tune it yourself, you know? So, so in, in <clears throat> the argument that I would make, too, to that is the, the feed of people that are interested in motorsports and become involved in motorsports is going to diminish, possibly d diminish, possibly diminish significantly because a lot of the appeal of amateur motorsport is going to change because you cannot just run what you run. You cannot... Like like Hondas, why why they were so popular for so long is because you could inherit your mom's Civic, and decide you want to take it out and, and run it totally socket mm. and autocross and realize, hey, this this actually is not that bad. This this car that's got one hundred fifty thousand miles on it that I inherited from my mom, actually it's it's kind of fun, and then you realize, oh well, you can do X, Y, and Z, and all of a sudden now, you can actually have a really fun and competitive car a lot of that appeal would go away or it would significantly change, but potentially go away. And so the, the feeders for the amateurs to come into motorsports and participate in motorsports, I think will, will change. I, I think it'll be significant. Racing really? will be boring to watch with just rich people. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of these guys, a lot of these people who are your top tier drivers, like your F1 drivers and stuff, I mean, they didn't start with F1 budgets and you have to beat people to be recognized. And so obviously they're starting in cards and going and working their way up through formula cars and stuff like that. But I mean, when the, when it costs substantially more to not only operate a car, but to win, it's going to, you're going to see the amount of like talented drivers on the main stage is actually going to diminish. I would imagine it might take a generation, but I mean, yeah. you're going to lose the access as the access gets harder to get into, it's going to be even harder to even be discovered, you know? And, and it's the, the, well, I know there's F1 yeah. scouts watching this right now. That's right. <laughs> I, I hear they're, I hear they're following uh, Scotty around all the time. F1 scouts. Yeah. <laughs> but well, it's, it's, it's that is, the concern is just the effect mm. that it will have on the sport, uh, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and maybe and maybe that is maybe it will not be as bad as it seems like it could be. Maybe taking power off the table and and bringing in bringing it down to suspension, handling, and weight, 
maybe it won't have that much of an effect. But I think I think if it, if that was not going to have as much of an effect, a lot of the OE manufacturers would have to step up and and kind of like what you were alluding to, Ryan, and and give us more options um, and, and, and produce the cars because they can like an like an OE manufacturer like Subaru, like perfect example would be the S209. They, yeah. they took a car right. that they, so here's, there's an STI that they make and it passes emissions and it's for sale. But then they said, well, let's see what we can really do with this car. Let's tweak it a little bit. And they did. And they made 40 more horsepower and it still passes emissions and it's available for sale. Well, it was available for sale, but in a very, <laughs> very limited number and it was very expensive to get, you know? Mm -hmm. And so that's, that's the problem is like, okay, well, if this, if this is now the layout where you, you can't modify a car, if you've got a guy that has an S209 and he's going up against a regular S STI, that STI, you are so far behind what that S209 is and you can't make mm -hmm. up that gap. Yeah. I mean, it's, well, it's, to be, to be fair though, I mean, I think the hardcore enthusiasts, the, the racing will survive because, yep. I mean, and it'll cost less money. I'll play devil's advocate for a moment. Okay. Now, since we can't, we can't modify <laughs> anything that makes any more power, now it's all down to setup of the car and the driver. And guess what? We've saved money because we can't do anything to the motor and well, we're still out there racing. But it, it, it would change the face of racing, and, and it, it, you're going to have a lot more spec classes. Well, and, and it would kill, I mean, for every anybody on this panel, it would kill the fun. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, my 450 yeah. horsepower Subaru is terrifying, and that's a thrill that you don't get in my 300 horsepower Subaru, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and so, like, you have companies like Honda. Uh, well, there's been a lot of companies throughout the days that have essentially built body and white. Mm -hmm. So yeah. the, the new Honda Type R, you can buy that as a body and white, um, which is essentially a stripped down street car. But, but um, with no VIN. But with, with no, no VIN. VIN. Yep. So, so that is essentially a race car. And you can right. modify that if you wanted to, but not if you can't get the parts to modify it. So that, I mean, that class as it is, is essentially a spec class. You know, you right. take this body in white, you put your own livery, livery on it, and that's what it is. But, and I'm not sure what one of those body in white Civic Type R's are costing right now, but I, I bet you it's expensive. I bet you none of us could be able to afford to go out and buy one of those. And there's not a lot of them. Yeah, I mean, it, it's, it's yeah. something where they only make a handful yeah. of them. And like Subaru, they, I believe there's body and white cars in Japan. And actually, heck, Ryan's probably sitting in one of them. But they, they've, never been, they've never been available over here. So like right. if, there's, if there's a manufacturer that is not going to offer a body and white option in the U.S., then, then, that's, then that, that takes that option away. Mm -hmm. The cool thing about a body and white program is that it would really help lay out the groundwork for – the RPM act in the sense that, Hey, this is like legitimately, this looks like a passenger car, but this is legitimately a race car. You know, it doesn't have a yeah. VIN and if they could create, and I'm sure I say if they could create, I mean, they, they've literally created so much with like a whip of a P board, but they could literally create a registration system or a documentation system for, for race cars. And yep. you go on say flat iron tuning website, and you see that you got to contact John Cooley to buy this specific part. You call mm -hmm. up that part and you say, hey, this is my uh, race car registration number. I need to buy yeah. an access port. You know, then like, all right, we're verified. And just like a gun, I mean, I hate to even use that in the comparison because the implications between the two are so scary. But, but just like a firearm, a registered race car everyone like you'll know the government would know if i bought 30 access ports for my one registered race car you know that's fishy right, right. but i would be you right. know i see that i did that you know the government could and, see that and of course you'd have to have a concealed carry so you could carry your race car underneath your trench coat <laughs> underneath your yeah. trailer well but but here's here's the point that you make that that i think is really worth hitting home on ryan there's technology available now like with, with the computer age and everything like that, that was not available when the Clean Air Act was written. 
Yeah, 50 and, years and ago. <laughs> so so there's, it, there's, there's a plus and a minus to that. But the plus of that is that, that what you're saying is would be entirely possible. Like if you say you bought a body in white and you, you, you got a registration number exactly as you described that goes with that car, that's the number that you would need to purchase the parts for that car. And that, that way a, a vendor could verify, hey, I sold this part to this car. Here's the registration number. You know, that's, that is a way to track it. Uh, beyond well, that, oh, go ahead. And they've already done that. When the, when the Solstice program uh, first started, uh, the carbon fiber top, if you had a Z0K option Solstice, which was like a club sport option, you called GM, you, you told them you had an SCCA license, they verified that for road racing, mm. and then you could get the carbon fiber top that SCCA or that uh, GM wanted you to run for SCCA. Ooh, and that's perfect. the only way you could get it. And, and well, see, it's a system like that that, I mean, they weren't, a, when, the, when the, the law was written, none of that was even considered, but now that's a very viable possibility. So that's, mm -hmm. if, we can, if we can get that kind of gray area, that, that open that conversation, there's ways to approach this to do it in, in, a, in, a, in a compliant and respectful way. And it's well, just, we've, we've got to start the conversation. So, and I, the reason I brought up the body in white is, I mean, it's really neat. It's cool that a, a manufacturer would create a race car from the factory. Now, one of the things that they're, they're trying to do if this RPM Act does not pass, that means that this 2014 WRX that I'm sitting in, I, I couldn't cut off the VIN and just say, well, I, I made my own body in white now. I, I took a street right. car and okay. I'm essentially mm -hmm. converting it to a full blown race car. So it, it, that, that's what this is going to stop if this doesn't go through. Right. So, so the, yeah. Ryan's body in white that he's sitting on right now is a purpose built race car from Japan. And it's, absolutely no different than this purpose-built race car that I'm sitting in right here that was on the showroom floor in 2014 at a Subaru dealership. Yeah. You know, there's one absolutely has a stamp, no one difference. Doesn't. Exactly. I mean, as far as use and everything, you know, yeah. like neither one of them are both registered. cars are only on track. Yep. Yeah. The fact that your car was made that way and I turned this car into it, it that's, that's oh, it makes me so angry that they're actually trying to go after this. You know, because well, yeah, but, because the cars are functionally identical, right? It, functionally right. identical. And but, the but, fact that oh, it came with the VIN number and it came with these emissions devices on there, but I can no longer remove them to turn right. it into a race car. And, yeah. and, and and to Ryan's point, I mean that's it, it all it all would would fit perfectly. Like if you have here's the VIN number of the car, this is what I'm mm -hmm. doing with it. I'm going to turn it into a body in white. Okay, well. You take that VIN number, and then it's maybe even replaced with a race car ID number. Yeah, now, sure. Or, now, a race car registration number. Race car registration number. Now, here's here's your the number for that race car that now lives with that car, probably in its logbook. And mm -hmm. then now now you can go out and and, and run that car and compete with it. And like you tell me the government doesn't see a tax opportunity there. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> you know like sure you yeah can, sure we'll race register your car you know i mean they already do sheriff's inspections in colorado at least you can build a trailer out of anything and go and get a vin number for from it you know like i don't see it why it wouldn't be so hard to do that to you know decommission a street car yeah or register a race car if that makes sense well and, there and there just there just needs to be an exception for obvious cases. I mean, that's, it's mm -hmm. easy. And then yep. we don't have to do yep. any of that. We have the, the mm -hmm. technology is there that we could, this could be very easily put into place in a responsible way. And, and, and that opens the conversation to make it possible. And, and then, you know, we can all keep running these cars like for, for rally cars. I mean, you could actually get a rally car specific race car number. Mm -hmm. And okay. So if it's a rally car, here's this, and, and you could even do something like, like the, the organizing body could even, I mean, mm -hmm. they have, they do tech inspections at every race. Yeah. One of the things that they can inspect and put in the logbook would be the mileage. You know, like, well, you know, yeah. if they would make the argument of like, well, what's to say that, yeah, it's a race car. Yeah. I have your rally car registration number, but 
how do I know you're not driving this to the grocery store every weekend? Well, let's, let's monitor the mileage, you know, or every week to work like Tasso. <laughs> Don't say that you're going to get him in trouble. No. Um, but, but you know, it's just, it's, it's totally possible now. And if they would work with the race organizing bodies, it would, it, it could, it could be very easily implemented and, and implemented well, mm -hmm. I think. It's just, I think it's, that would be better than the alternative hands down. Yeah. It, we'd still have that possibility and we would still have options. Whereas uh, the, the biggest concern I have is if this, if this would not go through the RPM act does not pass and, and a precedent is set in Arizona, a lot of, a lot of amateur racing is going to change significantly. And I would say not for the better. Yep. Yes. So Man, we've had a we've had a really good deep conversation about this. I don't know, maybe do, do any of you guys have any closing thoughts that you want to make sure that we that we touch on? We need people to not be lazy. We need people to go educate themselves on this thing. <clears throat> yep. We need people to to con contact their Congress people. Uh, I, I don't know. T talk to your mom. Have have yep. her contact Congress people. Get talk to every single person you know. And do anything you can to help save amateur motorsports. That's yeah. Yeah. that's the main thing that, that this is all about. Don't yeah. don't think that you are just going to rely on somebody else to, to fix this problem for you because you're not. You, we we gotta we gotta make a lot of noise. On and it, this. It's our yeah. It's our voices. It, everybody has to speak up and let their that let their respective congress congressperson know that this is important. That's what's going to get the Congress people to realize that this that there is a lot of attention being paid to the RPM Act, and that there's a lot of people that know that it's important. And that's there you go, Ryan. it's coming through real fuzzy, but we'll we'll get a link to that. We'll yeah. get a link to that on the site because because there's not there's not that many of us left, <clears throat> so we all need to band together and make some. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yes, and what? and if if we Love do that, that if we get the word out. That's that's the best thing that we can do. That's what I was trying to. That's what I was saying at the beginning, and it's 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 more true now than ever. Is just we've got to use our voices and, and and talk to people that maybe aren't even interested in amateur racing, but let them know how important amateur racing is to certain places and certain segments. You know. Well, and and hopefully when they have meetings to actually change the law or whatever or whatever, they will invite experts like us. To make the case yes yes and and have it just really it can be done responsibly let us help to make it so that it can be done responsibly yeah yes man well that is a heavy one but i'm i'm glad we had this conversation <laughs> if people are still watching or listening i i hope that you, you you've taken this in and you've you've enjoyed it but i hope that we've inspired you to kind of reach out and at least take action yourself. And if not, like reach out to other people, reach out to your community, uh, you know, of, of enthusiasts and, and spread the word and get support going for this RPM app because it's not perfect. It's not a silver bullet, but it's absolutely the start that we need. And then, and we'll just take it from there. So cool. Yep. Perfect. Well, thank you guys so much for joining us. Really appreciate it. Um, I'll just say real quick at the end, uh, you know, Ryan, he's available at DSX Motorsports. Mike, Mike Pettiford from Go For It Racing. Uh, what's your What's your website, Mike? Where can they find you? It is uh, goforitservices.com, just like on the screen there. Uh, the All number right. four, yeah. right F-O-R. Perfect. And then Scotty, <clears throat> Scahate I'm here. On, on Instagram and or at the shop. And, and uh, as always, we're at flatironstuning.com. So, Thanks very much for listening. Hopefully this got you inspired and uh, hopefully we can, you know, use our voices and, uh, and make some positive change for the amateur motorsports uh, group and community. So thanks thank guys. You. Yes, thank thanks you for watching and uh, we'll, we'll catch you next time. Stay tuned. All right.